Am I on yet? There we go. I just have to ask a quick question here. Is my cousin Don here yet? Is Don Wolf in the house? Nope. He was supposed to be here today. He was coming from Chattanooga, but they hit a traffic snag somewhere along the way, and he said he might be delayed, so he's not here yet. Dan's coming up for uh, a funeral later this afternoon at Highland, and he was going to come visit me, so I had to ask if he was here. There we go. Okay, let me ask you a question. How tall do you think I am? Okay, be nice. Play nice now, people. Play nice. I love you, Anthony. But no, I'm not 5'8". Okay, now without shoes on, I stand here before you. Which, by the way, how many of you know why I don't wear shoes? Why? Because I'm where? At home. I thank you. And in my house, I don't wear shoes, so I'm at home here. But that's beside the point. How tall do you think I am? Who said that? I hate you, but you're right. No, I don't hate you. I do love you, but you are, you are a truth teller. You are a truth teller in my home. I stand before you at the, the lofty height. No matter how tall I stand, I am five foot six. Now, I will tell you that that was not always the height that I was. I once reached the lofty peak. Now, don't snicker. Danya, I used to like you. I know it's funny, but go ahead. Get it out of your system. I used to be, believe it or not, five foot nine inches tall. Okay, now, don't be sarcastic. I, I did not come forth from my mother's womb at the five foot nine. Thank God. <laughs> I'd have killed her. But I, I, I was... You know, my brother and I, I have a brother that, uh, some of you know my brother, my brother Bruce, lives in Chattanooga, is uh, two years, almost two years younger than me, and he is six foot two inches tall, and weighs, and weighs 100, no, not 109, he weighs 220, he's lost a little bit of weight, but it's, he, he's a little bit bigger than me, okay, a lot bigger than me. When we were growing up, my, my parents have pictures of us. After, you know, we reached about the age of, say, two and a half and one or whatever he was, and we were about the same. In fact, we looked like twins. They dressed us in those little, I don't know what they were called, those little jumper outfits that made us look like girls. I hated those things. But we'd sit there and we'd look like twins. And then as we grew through our, you know, first and second and third and fourth and fifth grade years, we were about the same height, and so people thought we were twins all the time. It didn't bother me. It was not a big deal. And then all of a sudden, when I think I was in, I think I was in fifth grade. No, I take that back. I was in seventh grade, eighth grade, and my brother was in the two grades behind. He shot up. He was, I was about four foot 11 or something like this. And my brother went to five foot nine and then five foot 11. He was a full foot taller than me. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute. That's not the way this is supposed to work. I'm the elder brother here. I'm the one that's got the birthright. But it didn't work that way. My brother just took off. He just grew and grew and grew. And I... I went to academy, I was still five foot tall, and my brother's now six foot tall, and he's still in grade school. And I stayed that way, I stayed five foot tall all the way through my freshman year in academy, my brother's meanwhile six foot, six foot one, and whatever, okay? I grew maybe an inch or two my freshman year. In the summer, between my freshman year and my sophomore year, in the summer, between my freshman year and sophomore year, I went from five foot two to five foot nine. It clicked. I thought, I'm on my way. I'm catching my brother. I said, Look, look, bro, 
You've been towering me for this last however many years. Just hang on. I'm catching you. I'm five foot nine and I'm coming for you. I stopped. I stopped at five nine, but I thought, you know what? I did some research. I found out that five foot nine was the average height of the American male. And I thought, at least I hit average. I'm cool. I'm good with it. And I stopped worrying about it. And it's a good thing because I never grew another inch. <laughs> never grew another inch from this end of my sophomore summer, summer before my sophomore year. And I stayed that way until 1986 when I went on the very first mission trip that I ever took to Mexico. And then the plane crash happened when they put me back together. I lost an inch and a half just like that. Fused lumbar one, two, and three together, and in the process, inch and a half, gone, just like that. I woke up, instead of being five nine, I'm now five seven and a half. And I thought, oh. I didn't even notice it, really, but all of a sudden I found out that my shirts from here to here just fit different. Everything just didn't seem quite the same. And then this thing called age crept up on me. And you know how things you advanced citizen people. You know what happens to your bodies when the older you get, things just kind of settle down. And so between the inch and a half they took away from me in the plane crash and then the, the el elderly thing that happens to you, I am now five foot six and there's not a thing I can do about it. I can go over and I can, you know, I bend over a little bit more, but when I try to do this, stand up against the wall like this and I put that, I went to the doctor's office and and it was a shocking thing to me when they put that thing on me and it said five, six, and I went, <laughs> no. I hate that Zacchaeus song to this day. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Bro, I, I feel you. I came across a, a study. This was actually done in Britain, but I'm sure it applies here in the States as well. I should, I, that's not the study I was looking at. This was done three years ago, um, March of, of uh, 2016. It says, spurned by women, more likely to end up in jail, doomed to earn less, destined to languish in poorly paid jobs, plagued by feelings of, feelings of inferiority. You'd think Life had dealt short men the short straw. Maybe it has. Short men tend to be poorer. That's what the study revealed. The rapidly diminishing segment of the population older than I am will remember the celebrated Frost Report class sketch. Some of you may remember this, those of you who are a little older. Where John Cleese, Ronnie Barker, and Ronnie Corbett represent the upper, middle, and lower classes in the UK. Their height differences symbolizing who looks up to, down on, and on whom, I should say. As far back as 1915, it was observed that bishops were taller than, than preachers. Now, the significance of that is, is this. In our, in our church, we could symbolize it to, or, or relate it to this. Conference presidents would be taller than preachers. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what they were saying. Bishops were taller than preachers. In our church, it would be conference presidents because bishops were leaders. And so... Short men basically didn't rise to leadership, is what they were basically saying. Um, a study of 7,735 middle class British men born between 1919 and 1939 found that a three centimeter height gap, now three centimeters is basically a little over an inch, maybe not quite an inch and a half, okay? that, a, that a, a, a three centimeter height gap between manual and non-manual workers. 
In other words, if you were a, a, a manual worker, you were the shorter person. And it, and it took about 20 years for that gap in your wages to be made up. Okay? Also, they see short men as less powerful. One experiment, students were asked to draw a figure representing their concept of an average guy and an ideal national leader. Two-thirds of the students drew the national leader as the taller of the two. People just see leaders as taller and average people as shorter. When asked if they saw themselves as a potential political leader, taller students expressed more confidence in their leadership abilities and more interest in running for a political office. Uh, this translates into politics. For example, of the last 28 elections in this country, how many of, you th how many of them do you think were won by a taller person? I'll just tell you, 20 out of 28 people were the taller of the two candidates. By the way, one of, the, one of those persons who was the shorter of the candidates was George W. Bush. He was the shorter candidate. He beat, let's see, who was it here? He beat John Kerry, who was 11 centimeters tall, actually quite a bit taller, and he beat Al Gore, who was three centimeters taller, only an inch and a half or so taller. But George W. Bush, in both cases, beat the... Now, the other person, uh, one person who was significantly shorter, who was expected to win fairly recently, who was that? Hillary Clinton. Obviously, quite a bit shorter than President Trump. She was... I was in India when uh, President Trump won. And let me tell you, not only was it a great shock in this country that she lost... But, but I'm telling you, in India, my goodness, you'd, you'd have thought that uh, they'd just changed Sabbath to Sunday or something, and it was, it was quite a shock, okay? Not only that, women prefer taller men. Now, I know you find that as a terrible shock, but overwhelmingly, women prefer taller men. Now, that peaks out at about 185 centimeters. Now, 185 centimeters is just a little bit over six feet tall. There, there is a cap to that. For example, after a little over six feet tall, there's, there's no, not much gain because when, when guys get too tall, they don't, it's not a benefit. Women like to feel, according to this, this study, they like to feel protected. And so a guy that's taller than, the, than their, uh, their mate or spouse, whatever, is a good thing. But when they get too tall, it becomes overpowering, and that's not such a good thing. What percent of women are taller than their spouse or mate? What do you think? About 4%. About 4%. Um, trying to think of some examples here of, let's see here. Let's see. Nicole Kidman. She, uh, she overshadowed Keith Urban by 2 centimeters and Tom Cruise by 10 centimeters. Okay. Apparently, Nicole Kidman's strong enough she doesn't need a man to take care of her. Okay? Um, taller men, now here, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Taller men are smarter. Now, wait a minute. Okay? Height has been consistently but weakly weekly, W-E-A-K, weekly associated with intelligence by humans. Height may be an accumulative biomarker of general health during development, but gen genetic markers may impact both height and intelligence. Now, notice it said weekly. There is, 
it is not a given that height is always associated with intelligence. So all you tall guys out there, don't get cocky. I'm just saying. Shorter people feel less secure and likable, it says. In one experiment, 60 adults from the general population who were prone to having mistrustful thoughts underwent a virtual reality experience of a train ride on the underground. Now listen to this. The participants experienced the same virtual trip, um, trip journey twice, once at their normal height and once at a height that had been virtually reduced, virtually reduced by 23, 25 centimeters, okay? Now 25 centimeters is roughly, well it's, it's a quarter of a meter, okay? A meter is roughly the same thing as a yard, so it's about, what? Say again? 10 inches. Ten inches? Okay, so there you go. So that's, it's not quite a foot, but you know, whatever. It's a significant reduction in your height, okay? So although the participants didn't consciously notice the height difference, more of them reported feeling less capable, less likable, more insecure, and inferior when they were virtually reduced. Interesting, isn't it? They took the trip twice, once at their normal height, and then once they went through at a virtual reduction in their height, and they felt different when they went through being, quote, virtually reduced. Now here's one, short men are more likely to commit violent crime. A study of 760,000 Swedish conscripts, now conscripts are people that are incarcerated or whatever, found that 10, uh, every 10 centimeters of height reduces the risk of violent criminality by 7% even when adjusted for socioeconomic status. That didn't make sense, did it? That, okay. Let me read that again. A study of 760,000 conscripts found that every 10 centimeters of height, that's additional height. That's additional height, so it does make sense. Reduces criminality by 7%. So the taller you are, it says that the less likely you are to commit crime. However, the effect disappeared when adjusted for... Uh, intelligence, taller men are more intelligent, therefore less likely, there you go, you're back to the, the tall, so, you know, you take some of this with a grain of salt. Taller men may live longer, there is a vigorous debate around the relationship between height and mortality. Some researchers, however, have found that shorter stature is associated with longer life, so there you go, it's back to some of this is subjective. Taller people are more likely to die of cancer, so some of these things can be whatever. The, the point is that even though some of these things are, are subjective, there is no question that, that short people can get the short end of the way they are treated in society, can be. And it was definitely true in biblical times. We go to our story for today. If you'll turn to Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief, not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. And he was rich. And he sought to see... Now this is, notice what this says. He sought to see, not to see Jesus, but to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. 
But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Not a tax collector, but a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, it's interesting. When I was doing some research and study for this sermon, uh, uh, you know, one of the things you do is look up all the important words and whatever, and one of the most important words, obviously, is, is Zacchaeus and his name. Do you know what Zacchaeus' name means? Do you know what it means? It, it means pure. <laughs> do you not find that ironic? I mean, here, here's a guy, I mean, by very definition, first of all, he, he is a, he's a Jew, he is a tax collector. He's collecting taxes for the wrong country <laughs> of his people. And he's crooked for sure. And his name means pure. Wow. You, the, 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 nothing could be more screwy than this, to have a name pure Nobody could have been more misnamed than this guy. And his name, his height was obviously, you know, pointed out for, for, for obvious reasons. And when it says that he wanted to see, who, not to see Jesus, but to see who he was, that's significant. He wants to know if Jesus is really what he's heard he's like. And so, being of obvious short stature, and obviously the crowd is bigger than what he can see over, so he's got to find a way to do that, and the best thing to do is to climb up. Now, if you don't know anything about sycamore trees, they're, they're, they're the, a tree that has these long, overhanging branches. And they also have fruit that doesn't grow in bunches that hangs off of branches out the end. The, the fruit grows right like out of the trunk and right out of the branches all along the thing. And they also have, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's almost like bark that, is, that grows out of it so that if you, if you were to try to slide down, it would not be a pleasant experience. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So if you were to try to come out of, out of one of those trees, climbing up, it'd be easy climbing because it's almost like there's like little footholds almost all the way. So you can climb up one of those things, and once you get up in it, climbing out under the branches, no big deal because there's branches that... So getting a, a place to see Jesus was not a problem. So once he got out under that thing, he's got a place to sit, a good vantage point. He would have been obvious, not just to Jesus, but to everybody. And so when Jesus says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. He's, he's been pointed out. He's been outed. And that wouldn't have been too hard to do. But I, people might not have right away noticed him because everybody would have been focused on Jesus first. But, but Jesus focused everybody's attention on him. And then Jesus says, make haste and come down. The trip down had to leave this guy hurting. Let's just say that, because if he came down quick, unless he was using his robes to, to, to shield himself, but coming down, you got those little thorny, whatever kind of things on the brain. It had to have torn his clothes and torn his flesh on the insides of his legs coming down. Something awful. Something awful. And Jesus said, come down for God. And then said he came down but when the people saw it they complained saying 
he's gone to the house of this man who is a sinner. They didn't say tax collector, they said sinner. Which, by the way, tax collector, sinner, equivalent in their minds. Because Zacchaeus was the worst kind, one of the worst kinds of sinner that you could be in their eyes. Because he was taking money from them at exorbitant rates to give to the Romans. And some of it he was keeping for himself. So here's the thing. Zacchaeus is a very, very wealthy man. The problem is he can't even enjoy it. Because if he wanted, for instance, to use his wealth to throw a party and invite people, who's he going to invite? Who's, who's going to come to his house? Because nobody likes him. His family, some of his family doesn't even like him. And certainly none of the people in the town, they don't like him. He's a short dude who has a short man's mentality, who has no friends, not amongst the Jews. The Romans don't like him either because they're just using him to get money. They don't even care. They don't like him either. He's not liked by the Romans. He's not liked by the Jews. He's not liked by his family. He's got money to burn, and he can't do a thing with it. Now think about this. Because I, I'm going to guess that there may be people in the hearing of my voice that maybe just like Zacchaeus, oh, maybe not rich, well, maybe you are, I don't know, could be. But you may not be short physically, and maybe you are short physically, but maybe you're short on the inside. Maybe you've been told from the time you were little that you weren't good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not good looking enough. You, you can't do things right. Maybe you, you don't compare well enough to a brother or to a sister, to a father, to a mother, to an aunt, to an uncle. You're, you're, you're not whatever. Because see, you don't, you don't have to be like Zacchaeus. You don't have to be a wealthy whatever. You, you just have to have something that you're compared against to not measure up in some way. And all of us have, have something or someone that we've not been, comp not been able to measure up against. You know, I remember, I, I remember one time, and, and I'm gonna be careful I say this because I don't want to give the wrong impression, but I can remember once my dad was a really, really good carpenter. Uh, he did it for well, probably 20 years until he hurt his back really bad and he couldn't, he couldn't physically do it anymore. But I can remember he built, let's see, he built one, he built two of the houses that we lived in as a kid and as I was growing up. But he remodeled, hmm, maybe another two or three houses that we lived in. He was just really good at building things. I did not inherit the building gene. I mean, I know, what it, I, know how, I know which end of the hammer to hold. I know which end of the screwdriver to hold. And I know how to, I know how to do a few, th few things like that. My wife's dad is a, is a builder. He, he was really good at that kind of stuff. My brother inherited the building gene. He's good at that stuff. But I can remember as a, as a child, I can remember going one time with my dad to the building site of one of the houses that we were working on. And I can't remember exactly what it was that we were doing. And it had something to do with a tape measure. And just measuring something. And I didn't, I didn't do it right. And I, I remember to this day that the message that I got, because my brother did do it right, and I remember that, that the message that I got from that day to this was that my brother could do it and I couldn't. And that, ha that has stuck with me from that day to this. And I know that it wasn't anything that my dad ever intentionally did or said, but 
it, it was just something that came out that said, he's good at it, you're not. And it wasn't a life-changing thing. And I'm, look, I'm still going to get to go to heaven because you don't have to be able to build a house to go to heaven. You know what I'm saying? But messages can be sent in unspoken ways to us that can tell us that we're, that, we're, that we're not good enough to do certain kinds of things. And every single person in this room has had messages sent to them by somebody that tells, you're not this, you're not that, or you, you don't... Me-. Zacchaeus was too short. He was too short physically. But the worst way that he was too short was it had... had Nothing to do with how tall he was physically. It had to do with how tall he was inside. He didn't measure up in, in ways that had nothing to do with his physical height. And the most important ways that we are too short has nothing to do with our physical height. Because if, if getting to heaven had to do with how tall you were, then the tallest of us would have an edge over the shortest of us. Isn't that right? Being ready for heaven has nothing to do with how tall you are. Zacchaeus said, I want to see what, who he is. And at the end of the story, Jesus said, this day salvation has come to this house. Why? Because He is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is tall. Is that what it said? It doesn't say anything about that. That which was lost. How many of us are lost? Is there anybody here who isn't lost? There's, There's another text that I want you to pair with that one. It's found in... Galatians 3, chapter 29. And it says this, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That text applies to all of us, doesn't it? If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when, when Jesus was talking about seeking and saving the lost. And he said, salvation has come to this house for he also is a son of Abraham. All of us are sons of Abraham. Are we not? If we are Christ's. If we are Christ's, we are sons of Abraham. Are we not? The problem is we just don't recognize it. We just don't recognize it. We don't recognize that Jesus is passing by. He is passing amongst us. He is passing through our town every day. He might be sitting right beside us. He might be... Is he not sitting right beside us every day? Absolutely. Listen to this story about the insignificant General Grant. God often... often hides his greatest gifts in ordinary packages, perhaps knowing our heart. He doesn't want us to become enamored with the mode of delivery. And also that we might better appreciate the gift being offered. So we must be careful about presumptuously prejudging the appearance of ordinary circumstances, ordinary days, even ordinary people. In his recent biography simply titled Grant, Ron Chernow tells the story of Ulysses S. Grant's meteoric rise from store clerk to Civil War hero and beyond. By the fall of 1863, Grant had overseen the successful campaign or successful campaigns in Vicksburg and Chattanooga and suddenly national leaders and politicians who just months before would have hardly recognized his name now sought to rub shoulders with the union's hope of victory 
In October of that year, on his way to a meeting in Louisville, Grant was approached by Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and Ohio Governor John Bro. Chernow describes the encounter. While Grant and Stanton had, a, had communicated through telegraph, they had never even set eyes on each other. Short of breath, asthmatic, snuffling with a heavy cold, and short, the short stout, uh, stout Stanton emerged and barged brusquely into Grant's car, eyed the officer's present, and then began to pump the hand of a bearded man with an army hat whom he assumed was Grant. How do you do, General Grant, he cried. I recognize you from your picture. Stanton was embarrassed to learn that he was shaking hands with Grant's medical director, Dr. Edward Kithow. Chernow explained, Stanton later admitted that in assessing which officer was Grant, he had eliminated the real Grant because he looked much too ordinary and wasn't the prepossessing figure that he had imagined. Born in an insignificant town to unknown parents in humble surroundings, Jesus was missed by many. He was overlooked because, well, he looked much too ordinary and wasn't the prepossessing figure that some had imagined. Today, Jesus can still be missed. We can extend our hand to something that looks like joy while the real joy sits humbly by. We can pointlessly pump the hand of what we think will deliver peace, while all the while we are within the reach of the Prince of Peace. Jesus might be walking right by us. He might be sitting right beside us. And we might miss him, thinking that we have to climb a tree somewhere to get a look at him, while all the while Jesus might be right beside us. Let's not miss Jesus because we think that he's spectacular or overwhelming. Jesus is all around us in the, the hand of a, a child or, or the uh, a older woman that needs a, a walk across the street or someone that's beside the road with a flat tire. Jesus needs us to be his hands and eyes and ears and arms. And we shouldn't think that because he's not in some spectacular, overwhelming thing, that he's not all around us and everywhere that we walk. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you that even in the life of one who was a cheat, who was hated by his own, hated by his perhaps even family, that you stopped to go home with him and that you want to do the same thing with us. Help us to let you live through us, and to be Jesus to those around us each and every day. We just pray that you will work through us so that we can be Jesus to everyone that we come in contact with. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath. Go be Jesus to...